This is the World Cafe. I'm Raina Duris. The new Mitski album sounds like a movie. Called The Land is Inhospitable and So Are We, it's full of sweeping strings, orchestral drama, and even a few, as she describes them, jump scares. There are also big themes like love and America. But like any good filmmaker, even when she's building a blockbuster, Mitski has an eye for the details and knows how to use them to draw you closer and to make you feel. Coming up, Mitski joins me to talk about incorporating an orchestra, bringing in a choir, and arranging the choral parts herself. She talks about the composers who influenced her, and she talks about how this new album represents a new phase for her after her 2022 record, Laurel Hell. Mitski also touches on what it was like to be nominated for an Academy Award for co-writing a song for an actual movie, Everything Everywhere, All at Once. Just a quick note here. For this YouTube version, for licensing reasons, each time an album track is referenced in this episode, you'll just hear a short clip. We begin with a track from her new album, The Land is Inhospitable and So Are We. It's the lead single, Bug Like an Angel. This is Mitski on World Cafe. Sometimes a drink feels like family. on World Cafe with Bug Like an Angel. That is the opening track to her new album, The Land is Inhospitable and So Are We. I'm Raina Duris. Mitski is my guest today. Welcome back to the World Cafe. Hi, thanks for having me again. I'm so happy to have you. I've only gotten to spend a few days with this album, and I know that this is one of those albums where I'm going to interview you today, and then after like a month, I'm going to be like, oh, there's all these questions that I wish I asked her, (laughs) Um, but we'll do our best here. The song that we just heard, it starts with just guitar and a little bit of piano, but mostly it's your voice in a space that kind of feels kind of cavernous, kind of feels big and empty. And then this choir comes right in uh, on the word family, which feels Mm -hmm. like a significant word to come in on. I know you arranged the choir yourself. So tell us Mm -hmm. about that choice of having that moment be the first time we hear them. Well, you know, my fans know that I love a jump scare. Um, (laughs) And I especially love a jump scare in the first track of an album. So I guess I'm doing that again. Um, The choice of the choir was, I mean, with music, the beautiful thing is sometimes you don't need to have a like a concise verbal explanation. Sometimes it's just a feeling. And at the end of the day, it was just a feeling like, you know what, I want a big choir at this moment. Um, But if I were to try to Um, explain it, the song without the choir is super simple. It's uh, my vocal, and then it starts with just acoustic guitar. Eventually, there's some light keyboard and bass, but otherwise, there's not much else. And the song structure is also very simple. There's not really a chorus. And so it's kind of a way to... um, bring the audience in another tool to make the song a little bit more exciting than maybe um, it wouldn't be otherwise. And I just love choirs. I grew up in choirs and I'm just looking for any excuse to put a choir in a song. And um, I think I wanted the choirs to come in at really crucial words, words or lines that I wanted the listener to really hear. And I think a family is a big, multi-layered, complex, emotional word. And I felt like it would make a big impact if an entire choir was singing it. Yeah, I feel like it could be a, a surprise sing-along moment at a live show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would take a lot of coordination for everyone to come in for one word to pick that, <laughs> but uh, I feel like it could work. Um, I, like you said, you uh, grew up singing in choirs. Had you arranged for a choir before? Um. Not really. No, I've, I had arranged like my own backing vocals and stuff, but that's as far as it went. But you know, you grow up in choirs and I was always an alto and I was always singing like, uh, the weird harmonic parts that don't have, don't make much melodic sense. It's funny. All the songs I remember singing in choir, I can't really sing them on my own because they're weird alto parts that don't make sense without a soprano. But anyway, I feel you. As a um, fellow I alto, just... I completely yeah. understand. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it just came naturally from all the years of doing it and being an alto and understanding the that every part has its own role and every part has its, uh, I don't know, its, its, uh, its place, I suppose. 
Aside from the choir, uh, you had the band live in the studio. You also had an orchestra for some of the tracks. Drew Erickson did the orchestral arrangements and conducted the orchestra on a few of the songs. And yeah, for people who don't maybe don't know that name right away, he's worked with Lana Del Rey, Father John Misty, Tim Heidecker. Why was Drew Erickson the right person for this job? I mean, that's a good question. In general, he's just a really great orchestrator, so I think anybody would be lucky to have him. But in our case, we were specifically looking for a sort of um, an almost classic Hollywood sound or a sort of sweeping, almost Disney soundtrack sound, um, like old school Disney. And we also had some like Ennio Morricone influence, and we just felt like he is exactly the person who can do that. Cause he's provided sounds like that for other artists. Like you said, Lana Del Rey, Father John Misty. I found out about him through Father John Misty. Um, Father John Misty's most recent album features a lot of Drew's orchestration. And I was like, who did this? And so I looked it up and it was Drew. Yeah. We're going to come back to some of the cinematic influences after we hear another song. But uh, I did hear that uh, Drew actually brought in some members who literally have worked on Disney soundtracks for the orchestra. Is that true? Yeah, it's amazing. And just we got some of the best players and they just were so, oh, God, I was just smiling ear to ear the entire day we were recording. Yeah. We're going to listen to Heaven now, which has some of those players on it. It's such a beautiful song. What can you tell us about this song before we hear it? Well, this song is basically about love. Um, it's about how we should treasure this thing that we have. Maybe it's just within our, our own room and outside of our room, maybe the world is terrible or hard to be in. But for now, let's put the world aside and just treasure this precious love we have. This is Heaven from Mitski on World Cafe. Now I bend like a willow thinking of you. Mitski, Heaven. That's from her new album, The Land is Inhospitable and So Are We. Mitski joins me today on World Cafe. I'm Rena Duris. So that album has that cinematic orchestra. Outside of your albums, you've also worked on a few soundtracks over the last few years. You're even nominated for an Oscar for your work with Sun Lux <laughs> and David Byrne on the song This Is A Life for the film Everything Everywhere All At Once. It sounds like this. This is a life. Every this is a life. What was your reaction uh, when you found out that you were nominated for an Academy Award? Yeah, it, it still doesn't feel real. Um, and also it kind of, it felt like cheating a little bit because this was just this amazing film. Like it's one of my favorite films. It would be even if I wasn't a small part of it, but I wasn't part of the filmmaking. I wasn't part of anything that made the film great. And then of course, um, Sun Lux and David Byrne uh, Sun Lux did the majority of the writing of the song. I just, I feel like I contributed just a little tiny bit. So it f it's felt like just sheer improbable luck that I got a quote unquote Oscar nomination. It doesn't really feel like my Oscar nomination. I feel like I'm piggybacking on everyone else's <laughs> great work. And I'm really, gr I I'm really grateful to be a tiny part of it. But again, I'm just kind of like, well, this is nice, but I don't know if I can claim this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you did name check a couple of film score composers as influences on this new album. Uh, Carter Burwell, who did the score to Fargo, Ennio Morricone, who did the soundtracks to many spaghetti westerns. And, and I was thinking about that because both westerns and Fargo involve almost these caricatures of America. They both have these vast, kind of empty, inhospitable landscapes, and they feel kind of lonely, and they feel kind of violent. Why did those soundtracks capture your imagination? Um, you know, I'm not really sure. I probably will have a better answer for you in maybe one or two years, because that's as long as it usually takes to really process an album. A lot of making an album for me is just sort of like doing what feels right. And then afterwards, psychoanalyzing and realizing um, the reasons I did things. So I probably can't give you a really good answer, but I think um, I've always wanted to be American. 
And I could never figure out exactly what made me American, um, how I could be more American. I really wanted to figure out this place that I was supposedly from, but I didn't really know how to connect to. And a lot of the world outside of America connects to America through the movies that it's produced and the media and all these almost American caricatures. And I think that's kind of my way into understanding this place that, again, I'm technically from, but I will never, I don't think I will ever fully understand. Yeah, the the sort of myth around America yes. that kind of almost yes, keeps exactly. you from getting to what it actually is, if there is even a, a there to get, like mm-hmm. a there there to get to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the song um, Buffalo Replaced, uh, it, it brings to mind kind of the Wild West a bit and the buffalo being replaced by trains as America expanded. You've said this is your most American album. Um, you know, what does that mean to you when you're actually making the music? I think it's my most American album, number one, aesthetically, because I drew so much from not just American artists, but traditional American or what's considered to be um, traditional American music, like country music, Americana, and folk music. Um, So there's that, but also I've lived in America long enough and I've identified as an American for long enough that I feel like all of my experiences that contributed to the writing of this song come from a uniquely American perspective. I mean, I think, again, like you said, there's no way to really pinpoint what is American, what isn't. But um, for example, the freight trains through the American Plains, I feel like that's so unique to America or just the landscape of America. So much of America you will never find anywhere else. It's such a big, diverse country. Um, Yeah. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it does. I think it does. I think, you know, uh, I'm from Canada. So, you know, it's like we're we're so close, but so different. And the idea of what is America, it still it occupies us up there, too. And so it's so interesting (laughs) hearing you talk about that, because, I mean, yeah, I I think about that a lot. The the geography, the landscape, um, Mm -hmm. what makes this place special and different and, and why is there this sort of this sort of legend or myth around it all. Um, Mm -hmm. We're going to hear Buffalo Replaced. And I think right now this is my favorite song on the album. Is there anything else that we should know before we listen to it? Oh, I don't know. I would like for the listener to take whatever they need from every song I make. Um, Yeah. Well, let's let's see. After everyone listens to it, let's talk about it. Okay. (laughs) Here's Buffalo Replaced, it's Mitski on World Cafe. On World Cafe, I'm Raina Duras, joined today by Mitski. You just heard the song Buffalo Replaced from Mitski's new album, The Land is Inhospitable and So Are We. Okay, now that people have heard that song, <laughs> is there anything that you'd like to say about it? Um... Unfortunately, I think um, it's a it's quite a hopeless song, or it comes from a hopeless place, and uh, especially the second verse makes it clear that the protagonist is wondering whether having hope is even beneficial to the protagonist, whether having hope actually makes life more painful and harder to live, but still holding on to it for some reason because because the protagonist loves hope. In this case, hope is a personified creature, just loves the creature. Um, And I just, at this, I don't want to get too political, but it does feel like America feels a bit kind of stranded and hopeless right now. And I think in this song's case, that's, the American perspective is the sort of like hopelessness. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, it, it comes back to the title. The land is inhospitable mm-hmm. and so are we. I mean, mm-hmm. that land, I guess, could be America. I'm not going to. Yeah. I'm not going to put, I'm not going to say what you mean there, but <laughs> it could be. Um, I'm speaking with Mitski on World Cafe. 
the last time you were on this show uh, in 2016, so seven years ago, you talked about the toll of touring and giving audiences these emotional highs and these emotional experiences every night and how you were working on ways to keep it from feeling like a roller coaster for you and help keep yourself on an even keel. And since then, you've gone on hiatus and then you return to release more music and play lots more shows. You're on tour. Like, you're like playing shows for this album. Have you gotten better at finding that balance as a performer? I think I have. That's a really good question. Thank you. Um, part of it is learning to say no, um, learning that I am not in a uh, place of scarcity, that if I say no to one opportunity, I have to believe that another one will come and others have come. Um, and I think a lot of what was really making me unhappy was the feeling that I have to say yes to every gig, no matter how unhappy it made me because there will be no other gigs. Um, so there's that. And also I've, I've come around to realizing that, you know, of course my job has its hard parts, but also every job has its hard parts. And I am also very lucky to get to do what I really truly love in the deepest part of my soul as my work. You know, I get paid to do it. And so kind of putting things into perspective and realizing, you know what, um, I'm willing to take the hard stuff like everyone takes the hard stuff in order to get to the really good stuff. And I've also realized how much performing feeds me and kind of I've um, sort of zoomed in on that or locked in on that in my mind. Like, yes, there's such difficult parts about touring, but also I get to perform on stage and feed off the positive energy of the audience and really feel like I'm part of something bigger than myself. And I think that really keeps me going, even if some parts are hard. So yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of answers to that question, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think that makes sense. And performing, it's a two way thing. I mean, they're getting that energy from you, the audience, and you are getting something back. Um, yeah, I would also say, um, I mean, this might get a bit esoteric, but it's kind of like um, judo or aikido, those martial arts where um, instead of trying to exert force, you sort of take the energy of your opponent and use it for yourself. And I feel like I'm learning to do that in terms of performing, like just feeding off of what I'm given and giving back so that it's more of like a, it's more like recycling energy rather than me trying to push myself onto the audience. Um, again, this is really abstract and I apologize. This is no, like I getting get it. into I... performance theory, but. <laughs> I totally get what you mean. I'm speaking with Mitski on World Cafe. Um, you wrote a lot of the songs on this new album over the course of the past few years. Uh, and you know, the past few years have, seen a lot of stuff happening. A lot of us dealt with being isolated in ways that we've never been before. Was there anything about being alone and isolated like that that helped you creatively? Well, um, I am introverted. So um, when everyone else, and I have, you know, a home, thank goodness. I have a roof over my head, so I've, I've been safe. Um, but yeah, well, it was funny, and I remember in the very beginning of the pandemic, the extroverts were kind of going wild online, being like, I can't take it. And it was at that time, just a month into the pandemic. And meanwhile, I was like, this is great. Obviously, it wasn't great the entire time, but I'm just remembering the very beginning of it where I was like, I'm fine. <laughs> um, you know, in terms of whether the isolation helped with the creative process, um, I'm not sure. I think I was more um, actively isolated during the creation process of Laurel Hell, my previous album. Whereas this one, I feel like I went through the isolation and the hard stuff in Laurel Hell. And after that, I was like, okay, now I can move on and do maybe what I want or do something different. So 
you know, I did make some of this album during the pandemic, but that was more Laurel Hill. And now this is like my sprouting out of Laurel Hill album. Right. It's like we have to deal with this thing and then we can like kind of get back out there again. Yes. Yeah. I do want to talk about a song uh, that I feel like there's some tension in it about being alone and needing uh, the distraction of something to do a job or a hobby. I don't like my mind. Uh, in the song, mm-hmm. the, prog- the protagonist is uh, baking a whole cake and then eating it themselves. And I know you learned to bake during the pandemic. <laughs> Why was baking a hobby that stuck for you, do you think? Baking was a hobby that stuck with me because it takes such a long time. <laughs> and I had a lot of time to fill. And it's a lot of kind of precise work. For some reason, I don't really care about cooking, but I love baking. And I think it's because especially during the pandemic, it was like these re- this recipe told me exactly what to do. So I knew for the first time in my day what I was supposed to be doing. And then it took a really long time. So it was a process that I could just get into and forget about everything else for a long time in. And then at the end of it, you get a sweet treat. You're rewarded for doing exactly the res- what the recipe said and taking a long time to do it. And it was just like, that's what I needed during the pandemic, I think. I'm going to play a bit of I Don't Like My Mind. This is Mitski on World Cafe. On World Cafe, that was Mitski, I Don't Like My Mind. The new album from Mitski is called The Land is Inhospitable and So Are We. I'm Raina Duras. It's World Cafe. People love to uh, dissect your lyrics, and the album title, The Land is Inhospitable and So Are We, might lead someone to think that this is like a harsh or exceptionally depressing album, but I felt, personally, listening to it, that there is a lot of warmth and love and even sexiness in it. Um... When you're thinking about how inhospitable the world can be, where do you look to find that warmth? Wow, what a good question. I mean, we're all trying to figure that out, I know. So I don't have the answer, but I have found that, um, not to get preachy, but I found that as long as I love the world and love other people and love myself, sometimes that can be the only light in the dark. I found that if the the world is dark, but if I'm also making myself dark, then everything is dark. But if I just create a light within myself with love, then at least I'll have that light to look to. Um, And I've just, I just really believe, I've said this before in my bio, I think, but I just realized as I got older to love people and to love the world is really the best thing I ever did. It's better than any song I've written, any whatever achievement. Everything is blown out of the water compared to getting to love while I'm living. And I feel like that has really, I don't know, helped me um, maintain a sense of happiness and warmth and and lightness, just just holding on to the love inside me. Because also that's something that people can't take away from you as long as you hold on to it. I want to close out with a song that has a lot of love in it called My Love, Mine, All Mine. Could you tell us a bit about writing this song? Yeah, I mean... It came exactly from the feeling I just described of being like, wow, I I mean, when I die, everything goes away. I can't take any of my possessions with me. <laughs> but I wish that I could somehow keep this beautiful love I have in me alive. And maybe if the moon held it for me, then it can shine it down onto the world after I die and I can't shine it onto the world anymore. So that's kind of where it came from. Um, I remember when I was writing it, I was literally um, sitting outside on a on a lawn chair and looking up at the moon and kind of starting to write the song. So that's where it comes from. That's so beautiful. Here is <laughs> my love, mine all mine. It's Mitski on World Cafe.
Mitski, my love, mine, all mine. You're listening to The World Cafe. Mitski has been my guest today. Her new album is called The Land is Inhospitable and So Are We. Mitski, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me and a great conversation. I'm Raina Duras, back in a moment with more World Cafe.